sorry. You can go ahead and do eight and then, uh, cause nine a little longer, right? It doesn't matter. There you go. Oh, this is being recorded. I didn't know that. Okay. All right. So everybody's on chapter eight. Andres, if you can get there. Page 157. And Yes, page 157. And this we're starting to, we're talking about staging of properties for sellers, but it's really not staging them for the sellers, it's really staging them for the buyers. Because that's who's going to buy your home. And I think that one of the things that's really important to know, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this. I'm just going to read my highlighted parts. Um, just because no, so one of the things we have to realize is that that buyers, when buyers go to a seller's home, they typically have absolutely no ability to envision what that home is going to look like. They they can't see themselves in it. Typically, in most homes, because most homes are filled with everything from the seller, the houses aren't looking like you know clean well be, yeah beyond show ready they've got all the pictures of the kids all of the clutter you know you can open i remember going into a closet you open a closet door you know everything falls out you can't, you can't envision that you go in the bathroom they got all their junk everywhere you know it's just it's not clean it's not neat it's not prepped it's not ready so a buyer can't even see themselves living in the house because they they can't even picture living in the living room bedroom or otherwise so one of the things we do is when whenever uh, it, we're on page 157 whenever we say price is the number one issue in getting a home sold what we're really saying is price must match its condition price and condition are irrevocably intertwined which is beyond review of a house that's an, even in a market like this that houses are selling a little bit high remember we're having some changes now if your house is in terrible condition can you really expect it to get the exact a seller expect to get the same amount of as much money as if you took that exact same house and it was perfectly staged painted clean no clutter ready to go which house do you think is going to bring more value to the seller and to the buyer? The clean up your one. Home, right. Your house is your, when you're selling a house, when you're propping a house, when you go to a listing appointment, I always think of what is a buyer going to see when they go through that home? I know one of the things that we're doing in the co with the coaching clients is we're going to be teaching you to walk through your home as if you're a buyer. So when you go through a home that's full of clutter and just horrible, what are you going to tell your seller? And then we're going to learn how to communicate that to your seller so your seller does get your house staged. So how should you stage? The staging is a very, very important an integral part of the marketing process. I know there are some big teams like we have Heather Kane, they have a staging company right within their team. There are a lot of other teams that have staging companies. So what are some ideas that you would do? If you had to stage a house, what would you do? Uh, first get rid of all the clutter and mail and stuff laying around like on a desk and, mm -hmm. and take down the personal photographs. Would you do that all yourself? I might do that stuff myself. First, I'd ask the I'd ask the seller if that's okay, and mm -hmm. then maybe ask them to help me so they know where their stuff is. Would you have the seller hire a staging company so that the, they could have a conversation with the staging company and get some ideas of what they could do because that's their job. That's what they do. That's a great idea. Put that on the vendor list and have them pick from three. Correct. So we have vendor lists, which, you know, we're all preparing on, the, on uh, coaching. I know you're not in coaching, but we're doing that. We're preparing all of our vendor lists. You put it on your vendor list and you give it to them. 
when you go into a house like that so that they don't we're giving them a service that's something else of value that we bring to them is we're giving you a service is it going to cost them a few hundred bucks or whatever a couple thousand so what if you could sell a house for 500 or 600 would you rather sell you know spend a thousand dollars to stage your home properly right, right. it's it's a no-brainer stage homes on the average sell in half the time of unstaged homes that's on page 158 half the time one of the things that i notice if you go in and you look at all these luxury listings that are selling in a couple of days i don't know when i look at them and i look at the two million dollar and up they're all staged yeah and they're all selling right away and then if you look at the homes that are in that price range that are not staged, guess what? They're not selling as quick because the buyer can envision themselves actually being and living in the home. One thing I would add to that is, um, so I know on Amber's team, uh, Amber and Jared's team, what they have is they have a stager, but really what she does is she goes out. And I think this is something that everybody could do for their clients is you just kind of give them a list of rundown. Like this is what I would do if they're not going to hire a stager because not every mm -hmm. price point really necessarily qualifies to get um, a stager, go through and like make a list of things that they Everything. need to do before for photos, um, you know, have them do all of that. You don't need to be the one that does it, but you can you can tell them the things that need to be done um, before the photos happen. Um, because I tell you, you go into some of these houses and it looks like they didn't even know you were coming, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Not great. Yeah. And you don't, the real estate agent's job, it is not our job to clean a house to to empty out the closets to organize the closets that's not our job our job is to sell the property it, it's not to do that work so it's really important to make sure your sellers know and that is also part of by the way your pre-listing package the different things that you could do and i would recommend home. having yeah and having a preferred vendor list of a cleaner that could come out for them and do it to make to have the easy Absolutely. button like here's the number to call for this and if you have a cleaner that you're really close with and they can help declutter for them, um, that, that's also very beneficial. Now, I know you also need to have more than one because there have been legalities happen. If something happens with the one, you're gonna get blamed on it. You don't wanna have to go to court. I know Brindley Tucker, I, I don't know where if you were in there during the, that mortgage, but you do not, uh, Morgan, you do not want to get sued. So you don't want to be the one who is telling them who to call. So you give them several and let them pick. One of the things that I always do, I put my top one, number one. I don't tell them to call that one first, but I always pull it at number one, because what do you do? What do you, when you get a list of vendors, who do you usually call? First one. Yeah. That's right. And that first one you're going to make sure is the one that's going to really uh, really shine. Yeah. So I'm just going to read, I want to read the tip on 160. One of the most effective methods to convince a seller to get on the staging bandwagon is also one of the simplest. Because remember, all sellers don't want to do this. Sellers think that the house, they don't have to do anything anymore. They just need to have a sign put out in the front where it's something in MLS and it's sold. And remember that the market is changing and that's not happening as quickly anymore. Go out and take, and I've done this by the way, what it says here, go out and take pictures of a cluttered closet and an uncluttered closet, a cluttered kitchen and an uncluttered one until you have the main you know, areas of the house fully representative. If you have before and after photos of the house stage, it's even better. When it comes time to sit down with the seller, you pull out the photos and have the following conversation. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, let me show you some examples of what I mean by staging. 
and you show it to them so that they can see the difference. Now let me ask you a question. Are things being equal? Which rooms and ultimately which home will catch the buyer's attention? So you know what's gonna happen when you do those two. It's not gonna be the one that's cluttered. It's gonna be the one that's uncluttered. Typically, I'm not talking about investors, by the way. I'm talking about people who are actually home. It's not something like that's turnkey or something like that. It's a different, totally different property. A home must look like it is worth what the seller is asking. A seller will not get a chance at a first impression. When your buyers go up to a home, and this we're going into curb appeal, when your buyers are going up to a home, as they're driving in the driveway, before they get out of the car, they already know all the things that are wrong outside. They're already looking at the landscaping. They're already looking at seeing all the dead grass. They're already looking at seeing all the rubbish on, on the walkway as you walk in. And then they go and they look at a really old door that hasn't been painted in, well, five years and is full of rust, just looks terrible. And that is the first impression that your seller is giving a buyer to your home. And then they open the door. From the time a buyer opens the door, they know within seven seconds well, whether they will even consider buying that home. If, it's, if the outside's not landscaped and clean and looking properly and the inside is a mess, their first impression is gone and the sellers lost them even in a market like this. And in a market like this, when they know that the, the chances that the homes are sitting a little bit longer, you know what they're thinking? This is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. I bet you I can ask less. I right. can offer less for it. I would. Wouldn't you do that if you're going up to a house, the front door needs painting? First thing I'm going to think of is, oh, I wonder if they took care of the roof. Is the pool leaking? What's wrong with the screens? Oh, I would just go to the list. Those are potential negotiable or negotiation opportunities. Oh, okay, you know, this cost that. Price comes down, price comes down, price comes down. And it happens all the time. And it's happening now. So if you think it's not happening right now, it is happening right now. Houses are staying on the market longer and there's a reason. Well, they're instantly thinking, why are they sit why is it sitting? Because they've been going so fast. So they're mm -hmm. automatically looking for why is this house not moving? And they're going to look for why is it not moving? We know that it has a lot to do with the market. And their mind is this house has been on the market for you know 50 days versus nothing was on the market you know what i mean so they're they're instantly looking for reasons to negotiate but the reason okay nobody wants to pay what the houses are listed at now things are more difficult right now remember interest rates are higher people's buying ability has changed it's not what it was two years ago their buying ability is completely different when interest rates were what two and a half so now that they're all six, I know. So they're going up today. So now they're going even higher. And every time they go higher, their buying ability, their, yeah, it does diminish. And so when you have a house that's not staged and it looks like that, it looks like I can and that's your first chance to bargain down the price. And the seller's house won't sell. There is a graph on um, page 163. It has a curb appeal for an internet listing and um, flyers and cards. People still right now, and I know we learned this during, and I was so excited. You guys were, you were, I know Mary and Taylor, you were there yesterday. I know work was there, but I didn't see her the whole time. Um, Brinley said this yesterday, and this really excited me. Do videos, 
of open houses, do videos of the house, you have the virtual, the internet listing pit, you have the internet that you're showing that property on. Do you want to show a house that's cluttered and unkept and needs repair? What are people gonna think of you as a professional realtor when you're posting unkept, unwanted home on the market? And how are people going to react to you professionally? I guess you like standards and what you want to sell. You'll just sell anything. There's no reputation here. Yeah. Start day, we have a real diamond in the rough here. Yeah, diamond in the rough. <laughs> yeah, diamond in the rough. It was seven hundred and fifty. It's now five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> So these are some of the things that you look at when you're looking at a house, you look at plantings. You need to make sure all the plants by the house, they are not dead. I cannot tell you how many times I've gone into a seller's house and they have all this beautiful greenery that is brown. Mm -hmm. If it's dead, throw it out. You don't want dead plantings. Houses need to be painted in the interior a lot of them. You know, it, just throw on a coat of paint. And again, then your vendors. Here's a list of vendors who can who can paint your house. It makes a big difference. You just have fresh paint on. I'm not talking about painting your house orange. Talk about neutral colors that people actually like to go into. Refresh the paint now. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to watch what pictures are in the house, and you need to ask this one thing. A lot of people don't do. I do it at every listing appointment. Everyone, I always ask the sellers which pictures they want to rehab removed. There are people who do not want their family pictures on the wall to be on the internet and having all kinds of strange people look at them. And then there's fixtures. What's a fixture? Improvement to real estate. Something that's attached to the home. Like what? Like what happens if they're old, ratty? You gotta replace them or tear them down. I don't know what else to say. Go to Lowe's and spend forty bucks on a ceiling fan and replace it. Yeah. That's all. And furnishings, worn, tear, torn up, old furniture. Get covers. Do something. Call St. Matthew's house, have them come pick it up and stage it with something decent. It's not that expensive because houses are still going on the market. Do you have any questions? But that's really the end of chapter eight. Staging is important. Making sure your home looks, not your home, the seller's home looks good enough for her buyer. So when he opens that door in those first seven minutes, instead of going, oh my God, this is a mess. They have a first impression and please don't have dogs in the house. No dogs in the house. Buyers don't like listening to dogs bark in the background. It makes them uncomfortable. I did, that's not in here. That's just something I'm just adding. Don't run up dogs in the house. Well, one thing I hear agents doing a lot too is, well, A, you don't want dogs in there because then they're typically in a room and then they can't see that room or something like that. And then um, they're going to instantly think that they can smell the animal and this and that. Um, also, having a lot less furniture than normal, even if they got like a temporary, um, you know, storage to just declutter and move everything out so there's less furniture it'll make it look larger and don't most of us we pack our house right <laughs> we pack it right. and don't get a pod don't put a pod in your driveway i had one of them on saturday yeah get yeah, like there's a pod there and... no that just what that means when you have a pod in your driveway when a buyer pulls up to your home it means your home isn't big enough you can't a pod is a standard storage unit oh. that goes right in your driveway. Yeah, they'll, they'll come in and just pull the roll back drop right. and just, you just pull your junk in. Yeah. Go yeah. go down. They're not, you know, if you have to have it for two months, so what if it costs you 300 bucks 
just please, no pods in the driveway. Plus, it can ruin the driveway if you have a, uh, the tile driveway. It can destroy your driveway. Morgan? All righty, so tactic nine, creating and overcoming buyer reluctance. Um, did, did everybody read these chapters? Because there, I mean, there's a lot in here we're not going to get to go through. Oh, I know. Um, so if someone is going down the wrong road, he doesn't need motivation to speed him up. He needs education to turn him around. So a lot of this chapter um, is... It's just jam-packed full of stuff. So the first thing that we're going to go over is um, the diagram on 169. So th there's an example where you sit down with your buyer or seller, um, buyer in this case, right, um, that you are going to say, okay, you're going to create this graph. So if you look on 169, and you're going to say, start your pencil. When I tell me, I'm going to start going down. You tell me when the market's down, okay? They're obviously going to miss the mark from when it's down. And then it's the same vice versa. You're going to take that pencil and start going up. Tell me when the market's at its peak. When they tell you they've already missed the mark. The point is, is you're trying to get them to realize that there's no perfect way to time the market. So the buyers right now are thinking interest rates are going up, right? What are they thinking? You, you tell me, what are they thinking right now? They're going to sit and wait in the hopes that home prices go down and mortgage rates go down. Okay. Now... What do we know for sure? Say that again. Uh, they're going to wait to see if the home rates drop so that the mortgage rate increase kind of balances itself out. Yeah. And does anybody have a crystal ball? Do they? Do we know that the prices are going to drop 10% or 20% to match the increases that we've had? Nope. Nope. No. So um, this exercise, you know, it, it goes through exactly what to say on how to do it in the next couple of pages. So I would just practice it, like pick somebody and practice doing it so that if a, if a buyer is telling you, you know, they want to wait because the prices are going to go down. The whole concept is, is they could wait. But what happens if they don't go down, but interest rates continue to go up? Right. Because it's a pretty known fact. Right. Um, that, that interest rates are going to continue to rise. Yes, like we're going to see well. seven. We're going to see 7% here pretty soon, right? So if, are you really yeah. banking on, what? Yeah, I, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, you say 7%, but my very first house I bought was 18%. Yeah, but the, the reality is so. the people that are looking to buy right now, keep in mind, they could have been looking since the percentage was three or lower, right? And so now you're thinking they're at seven. The homes that they were looking at at a 3% commission or a 3% rate and what they qualify for at a six or a seven is completely different. So it's, you know, when we say they're gonna get priced out of the market with interest rates going up, it's really right. kind of sad, right? Because they were looking at a price point that they can't afford now. And now they're not gonna like it. They're not going to like the price point that they're looking at now, right? So that comes back to you got to find the motivated and, and all of that. And yet this is a good exercise because the whole idea is, is that you cannot price it perfect or time it perfectly. Um, no one has a crystal ball. And so our job is to really uh, to understand and help them make an educated decision, right? So well, uh, Morgan, uh, the first yeah. part, um, Morgan. Jeff, during yeah. our team meeting today, went over that as well. So we actually talked about this very specifically in our team meeting. So we did yesterday really as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there he, we go. He probably did the same exact thing, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And it's so true, right? Like, we can say the prices are going to even out, or we can say that, you know, they're going to decrease a little bit. And yet what we do know for sure is interest rates are going to continue to rise. That is what we do know. Right. And so that is your conversation with your buyers. Um, and so. Um, and sellers, both of them. And sellers. Both sellers, and sellers. Both. Yeah. Um, so understanding urgency um, on page 173, understanding buyer urgency 
It's the root cause and how to respond to a lack of it is imperative in a shift. When buyers are more reluctant than ever to make offers and are more willing to walk away from signed contracts, you must be prepared. You must help buyers discover a sense of urgency. This is when you, um, so right now we have, we have a few clients in coaching, right? That have written multiple contracts and it's fallen through, right? The buyers walked away or the sellers backed up. Like that is happening. And so again, it goes back to, you know, tactics before is finding the motivated and making sure that you're going specifically after the people that are really willing, able, uh, able, ready, and willing. Okay. So only buyers who are able, willing, ready, and willing to buy homes ever actually buy one. Able, ready, and waiting may or may not. As a result, when you first meet a potential buyer, the three fundamental things you want to understand are their ability, readiness, and willingness to buy now. The first thing is you want to find out the buyer's ability, right? Financial capacity. You know, what are they approved for? What's, you know, how much cash do they have? And what's their credit score, right? Like, are they able to buy this home, right? And this is where the interest rate conversation comes in that it's changing that buyer ability. Second, you want to know their readiness to buy, the personal reasons that they're motivating it's motivating them to buy a home, right? So if it's, um, I mean, there's different motivators, right? And some of them may not be urgent enough to make them make a decision in a shifting market. So that's where we come in and we say, we have to ask a lot of questions and find out and let them know what's happening because they are going to be very reluctant to make a decision because they're saying, well, if I wait two months, will the homes be down 20%? Right? And nobody knows. So if you don't really know that they're what they're motivating them, it'll be hard to get past that reluctance. Third, you want to know their willingness to buy their sense of urgency of when they want or need to buy a home. While all three must exist for someone to, to buy a home and a shift, someone's willingness to buy is what gets your attention. Got to know their why. Why are you buying this home? Very, very important. And right now, you guys, I mean, a lot of people's motivation, if they're renters, rents are continuing to go up like significantly. So a lot of people are looking to buy just because their rent's going to go up higher than most mortgages. Mm -hmm. Right. So that could be a huge urgency for someone. But it's again, it's about finding what that is for them. Um, motivation. So the willingness really, you know, when it comes to the market expectations, it's, are you willing to like, if they're not willing enough and they're unsure what the market's going to do, that's where you're going to work and work and work with them. And they're never going to pull the trigger. Ever. Right. Ever. They just won't. They, they're going to let you think, oh, I'm ready. I'm looking. It's just not this one. Oh, let me think about it. Um, let's just keep looking at more. And yet you really got to find out. And it goes on to talk about, you know, their actions speak louder than words, right? Um, you'll, you'll get a sense of if they're really well, willing and able um, to buy. Um, we want to make sure we have time to get to all this stuff. 178. Three ways to energize urgency. Um, one, become the local economist of choice. What does that mean? You have a really good grasp of what's going on in your farms and in your neighborhoods and in your areas so that you can educate them on what's going on because lots of people don't know what's going on in their neighborhoods or the area. Yeah, or even in Naples in general, right? So um, anybody else? So one thing I would say is going to like Jeff's uh, broker update classes, right? Uh, letting you know what the market's doing and let, leaning on the pro who knows the numbers and knows where to look to start learning how to, if you're not familiar with what to actually start learning about, um, learn from learn from other agents, learn from Jeff. Um, what should you be looking at? 
Um, I do like how it talks about that. I think it's a little bit later in here. It talks about the buyer list. And to me, that's being the economist of choice, right? You always being on the lookout, always knowing what's coming, what the market's doing, why houses are sitting, how long they're sitting in certain neighborhoods, things like that. Because you do that for your sellers, <laughs> but you don't do it for the buyers, right? And so it's just a little bit shift in mindset. Most agents don't is what I mean, right? Um, so when you look at it and you say, okay, um, I always have, when, when somebody's ready to sell, I, I pull, I pull CMAs and I do, I look at what the market's doing so that I can give them a, you know, comparable prices and homes that went in their area. Why are we not doing the same for the buyers? Right. Because I know that when, um, I've looked at houses before it would be like, okay, so this, somebody will show me a house and say, okay, this is what this home goes for. These are what sold around it recently and what they went for and what they have or don't have that this one has, right? You being prepared to have that conversation and being the local expert at each of the properties is super beneficial because it gives them so much trust that you know what you're talking about and that they're going to make a good decision, an informed decision on what they're buying. And that information, your buyers are looking up that information. They are on Google and they are searching it all the time. So you always give them your app so they don't need to go on Google, but they are looking at that all the time. They're looking to see what's been sold, what hasn't been sold all the time. They're educated. But you have the access to go in. Yes. You have the access to go in and say, okay, in the last couple of weeks or in the last month, this one and this one in this neighborhood sold. This is the comps for it and why they sold at this. Now the market's changed and here we are, right? Um, I know that when agents have done that for me in the past, it's made me know that like, this is somebody that knows exactly what they're talking about. And I'm going to, I can make a decision confidently based on what they're telling me. Yep. I don't have to say, oh, that's way overpriced or, oh, it's this, but they're telling me what the market says this home is worth. Well, also remember, it's not you telling them what the homes worth. It's them looking at those homes and going, this is the differences themselves. So they're telling them themselves because you never want to get into that trap of saying, you told me that house was worth $720,000. I never want to be told that, ever. Nope. This but house I sold would, for this much. This one see, sold for this. Here they are. What do you think? Absolutely. Don't get caught in the trap. Never. When your buyer or seller asks for that, man, learn how to... And that's why you're in script and role play is to learn what to say to them so that you can respond the right way so you don't get caught in the trap. I've done that before, so that's why I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number two, help them tap into their why. So again, you know, oh, yeah. we we talked about this a little bit. You really got to figure out their why because if when the market's shifting like this, they're, they're so uncertain. Um, again, is it the interest rates or the price is going to decrease? If I wait a couple months, if I wait, you know, what will happen? Um, but if you know their why, their why is they need to downgrade or they, they need to get a bigger home or, you know, they need to move, then none of that stuff, honestly, is a reason to hold them back if you truly know their motivator. Um, if you don't, you could be wasting your time with people that are not willing and they're going to wait. There's no motivation. I know right now in the next like several months, we're going to get an influx of people who have moved down here who are renting apartments who really, really need to buy something before the rates keep going up. And we're going to see that right now. And knowing, um, and the only reason why I know this is because I got a call this afternoon, so it's kind of fresh of mind. I had a test group call me from, that moved down here from New York, and they said, we're done. Our lease is going up $700. I can't do it anymore. I need to move now. 
that is huge motivation for you as a realtor to find something really fast for them to go into fast. So you need to listen. Fast because that right. you don't want that motivator to change. No, exactly. You fast. don't want them to second guess it. Fast. Yeah. All right, and then three address their buyer reluctance, which we we've been over. Um, mm -hmm. On 180, if you want to be the buyer's agent, know every home for sale in your marketplace. And that just goes back to being a local expert, right? Just making sure that um, you're at the top of, of knowing what's going on because they will see you as the expert and they'll trust you and it'll be so, so much easier for them to make a decision when they do feel like they can completely trust you. Um, all right, so the big chunks of this is on page 188. So the four strategies to overcome buyer reluctance. So number one, why wait? The hazards of timing the market. Um, I know some of this is like all kind of sounds pretty redundant back and forth um, in this tactic. Um, but when buyers choose to wait until prices come down more are also gambling that interest rates will hold steady or drop, which we know is not the case in what we're seeing the, the, the so consumer Morgan, what you just said that right what you just said right there this book was written in in 2008 mm -hmm. this was written in 2008 this is 2022 and right now we have buyers who are waiting for interest rates to hold steady or drop. And this is in 2022. So this is, I mean, this is very, very relevant. That is going on today, right now, all over, all over the United States, everywhere, which is crazy. And it also goes on to talk everywhere. Yeah. It all is. over. This yeah. whole book is still so applicable. I mean, it's pretty crazy. I was watching some uh, YouTube videos on a couple of the tactics earlier in the week. And it's so funny, like they're a couple years old and yet, you know, they might be two so years old. Relevant. A lot of people did videos on tactics um, right when we shut down for COVID, right? Everybody was going into the shift and, and it was funny because it did exactly the opposite of what we thought it would do. Um, mm -hmm. And yet the book is still so applicable no matter what the market. Okay, so- yep. The next part I want to go over is, um, so the interest rates, the figure 47 on 189. So are you familiar with um, the, the concept that even um, a 10% drop in home price um, is equivalent to a 1% increase? So what we've seen for the last two years is prices continue to go up. And interest rates just recently started going up, right? So what we have to look at is, do you know how to look at what the, what's the difference in home prices? So like, um, there, I mean, there's this chart, buy now or wait, right? Um, and it goes through, but I want to show you something. Um, and you might remember this from when Adrian did it at a meeting, uh, I don't know, like a year ago when interest rates started to- I remember this. Okay. So I'm going to, yeah. this to me was one of the most powerful things that I, I have seen Adrian do. And I think it's so applicable now because I'm going to be able to go from three to seven <laughs> to show you the difference in the price point. And if, if you need help with this, I'd be happy to help you with it later. Um, but so let's say they're approved for 500,000. Okay. At a 3%, can you guys see this? No. No, no but we can hear. It's okay. If I can screw it up a little bit. Oh, that's better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the monthly fee or the monthly, their monthly payment would be 108. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when the percentage goes up to 4%, their buying power is now 450. Their monthly payment, 148. So one percentage, but you're staying around the same price point or the same monthly. Because the whole point of this is 
you, you have to focus on the monthly that they can afford because this will change depending on the percentage, right? Uh -huh. So 405 becomes their buying power at 5%. Three fifty five at six percent. So this is where we're at right now, right? Mm -hmm. Look how so much. It's how long dropped. ago was it three percent? How long ago was it three percent? Not that less long. than a year. Less than a year. Yeah, not that long ago. So if somebody who wasn't able to buy because they kept getting outbid because 500,000 in Naples is still pretty low, right? And price point. So they weren't able to buy because they kept getting over, you know, outbid a year later. And so they took a break or they just paused because it was exhausting for them, right? Now we're at 6%. So the homes that they were looking at at 500,000 is now at 355. Now here's the thing. You can't really buy in Naples a single family home for 355. Like it's just not no. gonna happen. Um, and so right now you're gonna have a lot of buyer reluctance. You're gonna have a lot of it, especially if these people were already looking, okay, for Naples. Now, if they wait even longer, you're looking at 310 yep. at a 7%. That's $190,000 difference from when they started a year ago in just one year. So you're completely priced out of Naples. Totally. I mean, you were barely in Naples here, right? And you couldn't even walk on to Marco for that. Yeah. <laughs> for a house oh, on a house. Right. Oh, yeah. a little, condos, yeah. condos, townhouses. You're, you're yeah. in the ballpark here, right? Here, right. You're struggling, right? So the, the reason I bring that up is, is the why wait, right? Because a lot of agents are going to say, or a lot of agents, <laughs> you know what I do, right? <laughs> a lot of clients will say, well, I'll, I'll wait because maybe the price the price will drop and it may drop a little bit. That's that's We don't have a crystal ball. It may drop 10%, 20% but it is not going to drop $190,000. No, it's just not going to. So this is important to know for your buyer reluctancy to understand their motivation is going to be even, I can tell you if I was looking at a $500,000 house a year ago and I'm down to 310 now, there's not a chance I'm signing anything to buy a $310,000 property because what I started looking at was nine day different than what I could buy now. Yep. So it's just, it's that understanding that, and then, you know, being the expert and saying, okay, and getting them to understand it's only going to go down. So if they have a need and they have a why that's big enough for them to move now is now's the time because it will go to 7%. And the other thing re important, and this is not in the book, it's just what's going on now. There are builders all over Estero, Bonita, and Naples who are losing buyers at a daily basis because they do no, they no longer qualify to purchase their properties. Ouch. A lot because of builders are, that's so true. And a lot of builders aren't even selling like there's a ton of new construction, right? They're not even putting the homes on the market until they're done because the right. cost changed to do it. Right. And so many contracts are falling through because they can't actually buy it. Right. It's a complete different market. I like it when things like this happen because it just makes it exciting. It's not boring. Well, I think um, it, it just goes to different, like everybody says this market was so... Oh, it was getting exhausting and, and business was just falling your lap, but it was hard. It was hard in a different way, right? You were writing more contracts. You were turning more people down. If you had the list listing and you had 
you know, 20 offers. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Throw okay? them up in the air, pick and choose. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Uh, if you're a buyer's agent, you're showing a lot of homes and you're writing a lot of offers before you're getting one. So it's just going to be different in a different way. You're just going to have to find more motivated people and get past this reluctance to buy and help them see that there is no crystal ball. And if they're not truly motivated, it is going to be really hard for them to pull the trigger and for you to protect your time and what your time is worth. You have to find out exactly if they're, I mean, you should always make sure they're pre-approved and all of that. You guys, that's obviously a no brainer, right? Um, but you really got to find the mo the people that are motivated to buy even in this shift. Because um, you know, there's this word, there's one word that's a word that's really good to say when it's going to be a waste of your time and they can't do it. It's no, there's nothing wrong when you have an, a buyer who is not able to do that, who is not motivated, they don't have their why. It is okay to say next. You don't have to work with them. There's mm -hmm. absolutely nothing wrong with that. All right. But, so on um, 188, it says, this is a time to put your sales skills to work. A buyer's market is a skill-based market and you are best served to practice your scripts, find a coach, engage in ro regular role play with a partner and get familiar with proven best practices for helping your buyers make good decisions. Okay, so- and You and guys, listen to this. You just said that. All of you people who are here right now, we had somebody leave. You're all in coaching. You're all practicing your practicing your scripts, your role play, you're all doing all of those things that is going to give you the expertise to communicate with your customers properly. Because can I so, tell you, I talk to a lot, a lot of agents, okay, a lot. <laughs> and I will tell you, there's a lot of agents out there that don't even know what script and role play means, let alone are they doing it. Okay. And I, side note, I know that shift, this kind of sounds like doom and gloom. This is so exciting. Okay. You guys, this is exciting because this is an opportunity to take massive market share. There are so many agents out there. They're going to leave the business in 2008, 48% mm -hmm. of the agents left the business. You Let know that the market actually didn't get bad until 2009. Like agents started leaving the business before it got bad it got a little weird and they were out out okay so out. look at that massive you're opportunity being trained properly i mean this is like oh i get so this excited is why we do what we do i know it's fun because here's the, the thing is is the agents that are willing to go back to the basics or learn the basics you know, there's a lot of agents that don't know them are really going to take market share because they're going to know exactly how to find the motivated. They're not going to say, oh, this is getting weird. How many agents have gotten in the business in the last two years? Okay. A lot. They've never learned how to do a listing presentation because they really didn't need one. They didn't know how to properly work with buyers. They were just working with a ton of them because they were falling in their lap. So they weren't having to find the motivated, right. Or figuring out what was going to cause their, their, where's their pain point to make them push forward um, in a shifting market. So you guys are being trained the proper way. So you're going to have an opportunity to take massive market share. Whereas agents who are that this business has just been falling in their lap. There's a lot of them that are going to say, this is too hard. I don't really want to work that hard. I'm out. And they yeah. might've made a lot of money in the last two years. It's just a lot of people different. made a lot of money. A lot, a lot of people years. made a lot of money. And they have no idea that not to be no, a lot of them had no system no skill. Um, and so you don't even know what a system is in order to make this a sustainable business and our business, your business cannot be sustainable. If you don't have the right systems and tools and this is all part of it and you're being trained for that and it is critical to sustain your business and to grow it so i, I know that it, 
Yeah, no, I love it because I, I get, I talk to agents and I'm like, do you need leverage? Do you need support? Do you need systems? And they're like, I don't even know what you're saying. Like they truly don't even know what I'm talking about, right? They're just flying by the seat of their pants and they have no work life balance. They're just going, running around with their hair on fire and they're making, they were making money. Well, it's going to slow down because if they have no systems in place, those people are not falling in their laps. Oh, not anymore. It's different. It's not the same now. So just so you know, on the national level, we've already seen agents leaving the business and on a local level. I'm going to have Jeff pull the numbers and I'll post it. How many agents have yeah, left? You should pull that. That would be good to do. Yeah, because even like neighbors are seeing a decrease in agents. I met with an agent today. He actually joined us. So when you meet Victor, say hello. He, uh, he said that... Um, he took his class in December and even agents that were going through the process that like they said, well, the market's starting, you know, I, I've, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to do it. They went through the course, they passed the test, but they didn't even hang with the brokerage because they, they didn't want to do it. Right. So you're already starting to see that when we were seeing tons of people getting their license and tons of people coming into the business. Um, mm -hmm. So for those of you who want to plug in to the systems and models, going to be exciting. <laughs> All right. So on page, okay. So I, I, I just looked at the time. We have seven minutes. Okay. I know. Um, when, um, okay. So number two, trade up the opportunity of a down market. Um, so this kind of trade up is often, so you're looking, I'm looking at page uh, 190 on figure 48. Um, this kind of a trade up is often exact same strategy employed by successful <clears throat> real estate investors. So it's talking about falling home prices are a great opportunity for a savvy homeowner looking to move up. Even though your home price may be lower, the smaller loss of sale can be compensated by a greater savings at the purchase. So when we do see those prices decrease, you will see people. So just know this when prices start to go down, because so like Jeff told us, I don't know if he told um, you at your meeting today, he told us, People are starting to see, okay, so people are like, they're, they're going to hold, they didn't want to sell because they had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. Now options are becoming available. And so people are starting to list more. Now what's going to happen when the price decreased? You're going to see people say, oh, price decreased, but my house still worth more money than it was a year ago. I'm going to. There'll be I'm something about. to buy. I'm going to trade up because I can actually move somewhere. Right. Um, so there's inventory because the inventory is increasing. I think I noticed in Naples, there's like 2.3 months of inventory. I was so excited. We're not like that yet on Marco, but that was like, okay, it's starting. It's really starting. Yeah, it is. It is exciting. Um, I mean, yeah. that's a big deal. It's been a while. It's been a hot minute. Since we've had that much inventory. <laughs> um, okay. So when a buy, when you buy a larger or better home, you are saving more on the purchase than you may have lost on the sale uh, of your previous home. And a new home is often better positioned for appreciation when the market rebounds. So just having that knowledge and knowing that when the prices start to come down, even five, 10%, it's a great conversation to have with people who said they might have sold, but they didn't because they had nowhere to go. So just keep that in mind as this starts to slow down. Um, on page 192, this talks about that buyer list that we kind of talk about. Um, mm -hmm. So... Um, Less is more narrow the field. Uh, I love how it talks about um, what does that mean when you have client when you have agents that are or when you have buyers that are wanting to look at fifty homes, they're not even going to remember fifty homes. Okay, so you go and you create what you think is going to be the best for them because you're just going to confuse them. As somebody who's looked at homes, I would rather look at five and make a decision, then look at 20. There's, it's just too much for your brain to process and hold. So you be the expert. You ask them enough questions 
you narrow it down for them. That's protecting your time and their sanity, right? Because if you show them as many homes as they're going to want to see, you will confuse them and they will never make a decision. <laughs> They will be so overwhelmed by the options that they won't even know, right? So you be that expert. You ask enough questions to know exactly what it is that they're looking for so that, that you can pick the best ones for them. And that was part of Friendly's class yesterday. And I think we're all getting the um, slides of that. That was, well, the people who are in the class are getting them. That was part of her class yesterday. This, going and showing people 50 houses is over you don't need to do that yeah the more educated you are the better you know the market the more you have all of your information the fewer houses you have to sell to get them into the right one and you may not know how that conversation looks right now and yet you're all in coaching so that's a conversation like okay Catherine, tell me let's role play this how do i have that conversation with some with a buyer who wants to go see 25 homes next tuesday how oh, do easy. i have that conversation right so if that's stuff that you guys can practice and yet it it's great to understand that there are conversations that you can learn to have that will help you make make it an easier decision for them. You're not doing it because you're lazy and you don't want to go show the homes. I mean, right. you do have a life, so you probably don't want to show 25 homes. And yet, because I mean, how many people can you work with if you're showing that many homes? And yet yeah. they can't make a decision when you're showing that many homes. You're making it impossible for them to make a decision. It's overwhelming. Um, it's overwhelming for you to get all the information on all the homes. Now it's different if you have three homes in the exact same neighborhood that are all for sale, that are all priced right around the same. That's different. But you don't want to be driving from Lely to Immokalee to Naples Park to Benita to Estero. You, you don't you just don't want to do that. It's too but it's putting too many variables too many variables in their hands and the more homes that come on the market the more variables there will be and so you really like previously you really had no choice but to go show them what was available right it didn't matter how far away it was because you only had so many options right now there's going to be more and more and more that are coming on so you really have to make sure and you're you really got to realize that you're doing it as a fiduciary responsibility to them because it is if they need to buy and you go and show them 20 homes and they can't pull the trigger, you're not really helping. Only you're that if being... they're all you and can't pull the trigger, like what is going on? And remember the funnel. You, know, you have a funnel. All of this comes in here. You just want to come out the very best ones. And that's what you are. You're in the funnel. Yep. All right. So last thing, because I do have to jump off. Um, here's the point. You can't create urgency if there isn't a good reason for it and you can't you certainly can't fake it buyers can see through false optimism and <laughs> manipulative selling te techniques almost every time and when they see it they lose faith in you and the market you must find real honest and compelling ways to help them feel optimistic about the market and comfortable with you as the expert guide so no commission breath we're trying we're truly the fiduciary we're here to help answer any questions they have. And you start with by being the local expert, knowing the market and being honest with them and narrowing it down for them. If you are doing your responsibility of asking enough questions, you should be able to narrow down 50 homes to five or 10 easily. And if you need help, you got a coach. Ah, and you know what? <laughs> you, nobody's going to sign a boy, buyer loyalty agreement if you don't look like you know what you're doing. Absolutely. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. Thanks, Morgan. Bye. Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome.